Hello, everyone. It's been so great to hear uh, talks this morning uh, and really, really inspiring. So I'm Gilad. I lead the data science and analytics team uh, at BuzzFeed here in New York. Uh, and for those of you who don't consume BuzzFeed, we're a massive digital-first media company. We have presence everywhere, over 9 billion content views around the web. We're very active on our own platforms, as well as uh, distributed platforms like Facebook, Snap, Instagram. Uh, and we do a lot of interesting things with technology. We build a lot of stuff in-house. We're a full-on data company. We invest in, in tooling and analytics. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is a concerning trend that I'm seeing as a professional in the field of data science in the States and some of the ways in which we've chosen to mitigate uh, for them within, uh, within BuzzFeed. So I'm going to talk about specifically a, a data challenge I received uh, on uh, using location data and walk you through uh, just how easy it is to turn supposedly anonymized data into data that contain, contains PII, personally identifiable information. So I got an inbound from an independent journalist who gave me a challenge, a data challenge. He said, I'll give you a data set of someone's location history, latitude, longitude, timestamp. That's it, a few weeks. And your challenge as a data scientist is to figure out who this person is, right? It's like, can't turn down an interesting data challenge. So um, I got the export, right, a file. I'd never done this before, never looked at location data in this way. And this is a typical export from Google Maps, anyone who's opted in. And in many cases, you're automatically opted in. You have to opt out. Um, so you get uh, timestamp, latitude, longitude, some uh, uh, profile of accuracy, uh, altitude, right, how high you are. And then the phone is clearly, or Google is uh, clearly trying to predict whether you're moving in a car or whether you're still, right? So you get all this latent data within the, uh, within the data set. And so what you do is you first start exploring this data as a data scientist. You try to plot the different parameters. Um, so in this case, the y-axis is altitude, x-axis is time. Why do you think, what are these spikes, and why are they going below and above the median? Any guess? Flights. Flights, right. So when it peaks up, there's likely a flight. Uh, why does it go down? The person lives actually in high altitude, lives in Colorado, right? So the, the, they live at about 1,500, uh, 1500 meters. Um, and so, so what you do, what I did, very, I spent a few hours on this data, spent some time cleaning and exploration. This is what you would do as a data scientist when you try to build a product. Um, clean, explore the data, extract better metadata. So what I used was something called GeoHash, which is a way to split the, the globe into squares, equally sized squares, and have a unique identifier for each square. So the, the longer the hash is, the string, the more uh, nuance you can have, the smaller the square. So it, as a way to sort of try to track and see where this person is going, use geo hashes, then use um, enhance the data with some probabilistic model. So given place where the, the person is now, where are they likely, which venue? So I use Google's uh, location API. And then some time series decomposition. What are uh, some seasonal trends we're seeing? All very simple. And what you could very clearly, like very easily get to is, first of all, work home. If the person has a job, has a stable home, very easily find them. You could, using Google Maps, you could see what car they have, you know what bank account they likely have because they drive to the bank, they go to Chuck E. Cheese, maybe kids birthday parties, they pick up a kids from school, medical visits. So, so you get all these things very, very quickly once you've uh, associated uh, Google Maps API. I still don't know who this person is. I don't have a name. Um, and what seals the deal is when you join with an external data source, which with the advent of the internet is very easy. So done in Bradstreet, this person is a homeowner, they took mortgage, there's some listing. There's a name, then Facebook, there's an open page, you can see kids' photos. So that's like, that happened like, very, very easy. I didn't even do anything complicated. So I, I mean, I've been a data scientist for almost 20 years. I served in the Israeli intelligence. I'd like, I should not be surprised, but it was, sho it was shocking to me how easy this was. Right? I did not expect to do it this fast. Uh, so what I did then is see, okay, 
I'm still a, I'm still a professional. Um, what would it take for non-professionals to do this really fast? Oh, this is uh, a screenshot of the article that was written in Fast Company about, about this whole process. Um, and what the journalists highlighted was that the location data is being sold en masse by companies like AT&T uh, with the claim that it is fully anonymized and aggregated. But as you can see, anyone who has access to log level data can de-anonymize it. So I decided to teach a class at NYU, a graduate data science class, and say, OK, what, how, how easy is this for non-professionals? And these were, this was an introduction to data science class. People who had never touched Python before. Um, the whole focus of the class it was called Surveillance Society, figure out how quickly can these groups figure out the name of the target if each gets a data set, which I provided them, of someone in my network. So little to no coding experience, the students, uh, within a week, identified target names. And these are people who don't know how to code. They just used a bunch of online tools. Um, and then continued to identify very personal information, family homes, sexual preferences, intimate relationships, et cetera. Right? And these, these are just these are students. Um, so concerning trend, sure. Something that, interesting that's came, that came out of this process is uh, the acknowledgement that this, this idea around surveillance, it's not only the data that's being collected, which is usually our focus, we talk about what data we have, but it's the act of interpreting. And I feel like we're not, um, we don't have enough conversations about what methods we're applying to interpreting the data and how that potentially brings on harm. Um, Anomalies have outsized impact when making, especially on location data. In many cases, the targets were identified when they went to private homes. They live in New York. No, nobody owns a home in the right mind. But when you go visit a relative, especially for a holiday, which is an anomaly, it's, then it's much easier to match. And uh, when you join multiple supposedly anonymized data sources, that results in PI. So I feel like those, those, these points are really important because we rarely talk about them when we talk about privacy and, and surveillance of mass surveillance that's happening. So you may think, OK, so what? These are businesses. They're not evil. They're like, you know, they're making money. And they have, I mean, most companies don't have such a smart CEO like Jeff uh, from Foursquare. But I, you know, it's, you may say, so what? This, this is a business, and you know, some have internal ethics boards. Um, but I say, are we convinced that all these applications that get our data by default have the right incentives? If push comes to shove, would they sell it right, if they needed the money? I don't know. Why should we trust them? Right? And so in our, in our account uh, on, uh, on the uh, banality of evil, Hannah Arendt, when she was uh, looking at the Eichmann trial in Tel Aviv, was talking about the, this idea that you can be so detached from the evil act, you sort of in, in these larger organizations, you're part of the machine, and you don't have a sense of what you're enabling, right? We also saw that, she called it the banality of, of evil, right? We saw that with uh, Cambridge Analytica last year, data scientists working on optimizing and updating their model, iterating on their models, didn't Ultimately, they had no idea of what the, the business implications were, what the company was actually selling. Right? And I'd say I'd extend it. It's not only data scientists working on these products. It's product managers. It's engineers. Everyone involved should be raising their head and asking questions. Right? And so what we did at BuzzFeed very quickly, because I'm about to run out of time, we've instituted a set of processes and tools to make sure we are able to raise our heads, right? to ask the right questions and stop problematic processes that uh, don't uh, align with, with the company's values. So around data collection, we've obviously implemented GDPR uh, in, outside of the US. But we are, when, we, when we try to integrate a new data source, we ask, why do we need it? What's the, what's the reason to index? Who is it available to? Uh, what would be the worst case scenario if this were to leak? Right? Could it potentially lead to harm of users? So we have these processes in place. For every RFC, we ask, why are we collecting this data? We also build a, a number of scenarios internally. What is the worst case that could happen? What, what if this data leaks, as I mentioned? Or what is, uh, uh, how could this product that we want to build be used for? 
And for every RFC, again, we have a section where we talk about uh, uh, disparate impact. We say, okay, what's the worst case scenario uh, that we could use this for? And we also do a lot of analyses and reporting to our audiences to teach them about potential harm, to, to highlight how misinformation, manipulation happens. We were the first to introduce the term fake news. BuzzFeed News was the first to write about what's happening on Facebook uh, before the elections here in the States. Right, so we do a lot of work to enable our audience to understand what's going on. Uh, some of the plots you're seeing are ways in which we identify uh, uh, automated and fake accounts on Facebook and Twitter. So, to enable this code of ethics, we put together an internal set of processes. We've invested a lot in, in trying to understand these sort of scenarios and where we draw the line. And I could talk to any, any of you who's interested later uh, about uh, some more specifics uh, uh, things that we've implemented. Uh, thank you. That's all.